Motorsport is absolutely ripe for picking incredible movie plot lines. It's filled with stories that seem to come directly from a film studio. That's why Le Mans 66 was chosen as the subject of a film and why Rush worked so well. There have been a lot of good and a lot of bad motorsport movies, and the good ones always seem to be based on true stories. But there are still plenty of incredible motorsport stories that should be told on the big screen, and here's seven that Hollywood should start work on right now. And if you like this video, please do give it a like, and if you want more, subscribe to the channel. If anyone in motorsport today deserves a Hollywood film, it's Alex Zanardi. Multiple kart champion in his first era in the sport, he heads off to Formula One to try and find fame. There, he is an outsider. Struggling to get used to groove tyres and unable to get up to speed, Zanardi is out after just one season. He heads back to kart to try and find himself again, and is gradually working his way back when it happens. He wakes up in a hospital bed in Germany with no legs. The crash was so horrific, his legs weren't medically amputated. They were cleaved from his body. But Zanardi will not be stopped. He doesn't care if he has no legs. He will show the world. He's going racing again, and he will win. Sure, he cannot race an IndyCar, but there's more to the world than that. Three years later, he's in a BMW touring car racing in the World Touring Car Championship. 14 races later, he's on the top step of the podium, a disabled racing driver showing the world that nothing can stop him. Motorsport simply cannot contain the new Alex Zanardi. He discovers a love for hand cycling and isn't just going to enjoy it as a hobby. He'll become the very best in the world. And he does, winning four Paralympic titles and 10 world championship crowns. It's all starting to sound a bit ridiculous now, but it's true. If this was a Hollywood script, you'd dismiss it as overblown nonsense. And then someone would point out that it was all real. In June 1970, Bruce McLaren stepped into a new version of his team's Can-Am contender, the M8D at Goodwood. He would never finish his testing session, crashing fatally off the Lavant Strait. It was just a few days before the start of the 1970 Can-Am season. McLaren was the reigning champion and his team the dominant force in American sports car racing. The team was left devastated and potentially directionless. It was down to their other driver, Kiwi 1967 Formula One champion Denny Holm, to try and gather the shattered group together and attempt to get through the season. No simple task, made even harder by the fact that Holm had suffered horrific burns in a fire at the Indy 500 that year and was racing in agony with his hands bandaged. Rather than shy away and let his hands recover, Holm returned to the cockpit straight away. He could barely wear gloves and raced with hands that couldn't properly grip the wheel, but he fought to finish third in his return to the cockpit and would then go on to win six of the following nine races. Bonding the team together around him, he helped McLaren cars win nine of the ten races and won the championship himself by over 65 points. A season of incredible heartbreak was turned into a triumph when everything seemed dead set against the team. Without the stoic force of Holm, McLaren might well have collapsed there and then. It would make the perfect Hollywood blockbuster. This one could play out in one of two ways. Either you follow the efforts of the Williams team reeling from the death of Ayrton Senna at the start of the season, led by Damon Hill, a man with the pressure of the world on his shoulders as the son of a two-time champion. They would spend the season battling against a force that wasn't fighting on a level playing field. The Benetton team that spent the season fighting allegations of illegal fuel rigs, use of traction control systems and a two-race ban for their lead driver, Michael Schumacher, for ignoring black flags. Williams and Hill, in this case, would come up short after a highly suspicious 
suspicious incident in the final race of the year, which guaranteed a championship for Schumacher. Or, if you wanted to play up the other side, you could go into the Benetton garage and play a fight against the world from the cheeky anti-heroes led by the always troublesome Tom Walkinshaw. Either way, it would be another down-to-the-wire tale with twists and turns along the way. A triumph out of near tragedy here. The story of a team that had reached the top in the mid-2000s before nearly going out of business, only to recover to the most amazing of successes. You'd start the tale inside the 2008 season, with Honda and Jensen Button's F1 careers appearing to be on a trajectory for the exit. Honda then pull all the money from under the team's feet despite the fact that they are working on a potential secret weapon for the following season. It's left to Ross Braun and Jensen Button, and just them of course, as this is a movie so they have to do it all themselves, to rescue everything. Come the start of the season, they only just make the grid with the Braun GP001 and some help from Mercedes. They're ready to show everyone, and especially Honda, exactly what they can do. If you really wanted, you could follow the season. Or you could finish the film as the lights go green in Melbourne. A true story of redemption. It has even got Richard Branson in there if you really want. Set against a backdrop of a three-way fight for the World Championship glory, fought out right here at Goodwood. The stars are John Wire irascible team manager of the Aston Martin sports car programme, who's been in charge for a decade with little success, and Sterling Moss, a young hotshot with the world in the palms of his hands. Moss is surrounded at all times by beautiful women and lives an apparently carefree playboy lifestyle, but belies this image by being able to drive almost anything faster than anyone else. He's not just some rich fly-by-night. Moss sets off, on what seems at first like a victory lap in the final race of a gruelling season, the Goodwood Nine Hours. The season has gone well for Aston Martin, and with Moss streaking away from the start, this should be a cakewalk. He hands over the car to a teammate and heads off, only later to see smoke rising from the pits. As Moss rushes over, he finds the cremated remains of the car he was going to take to championship victory. It's all over. But not if John Wire has anything to do with it. In comes the sister car, using a pit box valiantly vacated by an independent team next to the extinguished carcass of the old car, and Moss is bundled in. Moss is no longer in the lead. Instead, there is a deficit to be made up. And off he goes, lapping faster and faster, hurling the beautiful Aston Martin DBR1 past slower cars as if they're stationary. Hours later, he's home. The winner in an incredible, scarcely believable turnaround, Aston Martin are champions for the first and only time. Everyone loves a political thriller these days, and this is one that would give even House of Cards a run for its money. The fierce battle for control of Formula One in the late 70s and early 80s is a tale of intrigue and treachery, full of backstabbing, rule-breaking strikes, threats, and with victims cast aside all over the place. FISA was the subsection of the FIA tasked with looking after Formula One. Fokker was the organisation put together to look after the rights of the teams. Teams that were aggrieved that rules seemed to be enforced to benefit certain competitors above others. FISA thought the teams were too loud and wanted too much control. At one point, they threatened to not let any of the Fokker teams race. At another, the Fokker teams held their own unsanctioned Formula One event. It comes to a head in 1982 when both sides of the war stretch the F1 rulebook to absolute breaking point, and the Fokker teams go on strike, boycotting the San Marino Grand Prix. But the stars would be two men, Bernie Eccleston, who owned the Brabham team at the time, and his legal advisor, Max Mosley. 
Between them, they would lead the Fokker side, before eventually jumping ship at the end of the war, turning Gamekeeper to emerge in charge of everything. It's the ultimate political showdown. Sure, it's been told in a pretty decent documentary, although, if you ask many, me included, it paints Prost in an unnecessarily bad light, but there's not been a drama about this amazing story yet. Imagine it, the two protagonists, both at the very top of their games, thrust into rivalry in the same team, both thinking that the other was out to get them, thinking teams were favouring the other, and in some cases willing to do almost anything to get one over. It features clashes that decide championships, violent coming togethers, and emotional outbursts. And then, later in life, they reconcile. The two become friends, and the calming effect of age seems to have won over. That is, until disaster strikes. These are just seven possible movies about motorsport. But which stories would you like to see on the big screen? Let us know in the comments below.